Loretta Phelps, Master Psychologist, Certified Addiction Counselor, as well as a Peer Specialist. And uh, thank you for tuning in. My name is Naomi Julian. I am the CEO at Anise Incorporated. We are an agency that offered uh, psychosocial support to individuals that are HIV positive. We also offer PrEP treatment to individuals by training. I am a social worker. Uh, I'm also a certified uh, counselor and also certified in domestic violence. I'm Philip, and I'm a recovering addict, also live with HIV. I was diagnosed HIV positive October 31st of 1994, and I've been clean now for six years and a half. Welcome to What's Happening in These Streets. I'm Loretta Feltz at the location of Madam C.J. Walker Museum in the Atlanta area. Today's uh, topic is about HIV and AIDS. Are we living or are we dying? My guest today is Ms. Naomi Julian of Anise Services Support Agency, as well as an advocate who has a wealth of information about HIV and AIDS. So I want you to uh, please join us for a conversation here on what's happening in these streets. What's, uh, first of all, I wanna welcome you both, uh, you, you all to the uh, set, uh, to talk about this topic that has been an epidemic uh, for a period, period of 40 years. It has been around, and the reason why the topic is are we living or are we dying is because there's a lot of misinformed information out there to uh, help the public to understand the dynamics of HIV and AIDS. And I wanna welcome you once again. So my first question to you is, how should the public view HIV and AIDS? And can we safely say with medications we are progressing? Yes, I'm Philip and I'm an addict and I'm also living with HIV. I was diagnosed October 31st of 1994. And what I say is that yes, I am living and they should, we are human. We're not a disease, we're not poison. We're human beings with real feelings and emotions, and I'm definitely living and I'm not dying. Great, great answer. So, Miss Julian, what is your take on that question as well? Um, how, would, how does the public view that from a professional standpoint of a person working in the profession every day? Uh, thank you for having me. So I would say uh, despite the misinformation, there's still a lot of misinformation about HIV going around. And there's a lot of stigma associated with HIV as well, whether it's um, gender-based, race-based. But um, I do believe that we've made a lot of progress related to HIV with uh, medication that we have available. So I agree with you. Uh, people living with HIV are living. They are not dying. They are able to lead um, to lead a healthy life. And I do think that we still need to push on education, educating people about what HIV is, because the same stigma associated with HIV in the 80s are still around. There are people that don't want to sit next to individuals that are HIV positive because they think that they might uh, get HIV just by sitting next to them. Mm -hmm, exactly. And see, that was the stigma associated back in the 80s when HIV first arrived in the United States mm -hmm. and there was uh, so, so much misunderstanding about the disease that uh, they put restriction of uh, encounters with each other. My next question is, with so many components to this uh, topic, who's most at risk? Well, for me, I'll say the persons that are most at risk are the ones that are uneducated and still don't understand the transmission of it and the people that don't even understand the significance of what is HIV and what is AIDS. Okay. And there is a, um, anybody can contract HIV. It doesn't matter what your race, what your gender, your age. 
uh, if you are sexual, sexually active, you are at risk of contracting HIV. If you live in a community that uh, that has a high rate of HIV, you are at risk of uh, contracting HIV. We also have subpopulation that are more at risk because of once again stigma that associate with hiv we have uh, same gender loving men for example uh, bisexual uh, men for example that does not remove heterosexual from the picture because african-american women right now is uh, have a high rate of hiv amongst us yes. so so in in respect to what both of you are saying about the topic um so is it oh, is it safe to say that with PrEP, I can use PrEP? And, and, and can you identify what PrEP is? So you was talking about PrEP. I just know PrEP. I wish PrEP was around years ago, but it didn't come to after. And I, what I understand about PrEP is one of the pills that they take, which is Trovada. And I was on Trovada for a while, but that was because I was actually diagnosed with HIV. PrEP is also what I know is you have to have a... a you can't be HIV positive or anything like that to order to start on PrEP. And PrEP is for people like with me and my partner. I'm HIV positive and my partner is not. So we choose to date PrEP, so therefore he had to go get tested and all. So, as I was saying uh, prior to treatment and what have you, PrEP is a, it's a new drug that they're using today. Um, so, how does that impact your life today? Well, for me, again, PrEP is very helpful for me because, as I was saying, my partner is not living with the virus. He's under T. don't have the virus at all, and I am, so therefore we can have sex, and he won't, I can infect him because of the PrEP. So, Ms. Julian, um, does anybody believe in, in this panel, do you all believe that PrEP is a small cure for HIV-AIDS transmission? Ms. Julian, can you answer that? I believe PrEP, uh, which is uh, pre-exposure uh, prophylaxis, it's what I call, uh, I compare PrEP to what birth control is to individuals that are high risk of contracting HIV. So I do consider PrEP to be a very important tool in uh, preventing HIV, in that if you are taking your PrEP every day as prescribed, you are likely not to contract HIV even if you were to sleep with an individual that, an individual that is HIV positive. This is another good question that I have in respect to uh, PrEP. When the T cells are non-detectable, for HIV AIDS status, is the virus still transmitted? Uh, in our community, we like to talk about a U equal U. So undetectable basically mean un untransmissible. So if uh, an individual who are HIV positive is taking their medication like prescribed, their viral load will be uh, at a point where they are not going to transmit the virus oh, if you, okay. they sleep with an individual. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. Um, so we have various programs here in the city uh, with our uh, healthcare system. Um, and I think it's the IDP program. What is the IDP program? What, what is that? So Grady IDP, it's one of the providers that uh, individuals that are living with HIV can go to, to uh, receive their prescription just like Anise Incorporated is one of the agency they can go to to receive additional supportive services like mental health, substance abuse, because for a long time we've treated HIV as a medical only um, uh, disease, but it's so much more than that. Mm -hmm. Individuals that are, uh, that are HIV positive need additional support like mental health, substance abuse, like you mentioned, you being a uh, having addiction um, issues so having the supportive system to help you through that kind of help you correct me if I'm wrong stay on your medication yes yeah. so basically uh, the HIV the substance use uh, ties together and being promiscuous can I say being uh, with substance use can I say that that is a high risk for individuals to contract the HIV yes. because of promiscuous sexual behaviors? Yeah, just because of that as well, and even me being a recovering addict, 
in living with the virus, when I was using, it wasn't about telling people my status. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about taking the medications. It was about finding ways and means to get that one more hit. Right. So I had a lot of unprotected sex and I didn't tell people my status wow. because again, because of the stigma, I don't want the person to say, well, I'm not gonna have sex with you, even with a condom, that stopped me from getting my drugs. But you know, uh, also back in the 90s, I think it was late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s, when they uh, implemented the law that if you don't tell your status, then you can be arrested. And I think it was a 10 year sentence that they put on that, that if you don't tell what's going on with you, because a lot of people were passing the virus because at first it was a death sentence mm -hmm. because the AZT wasn't really working properly. So were you a part of that era? Yes, I was. So how did AZT impact you? Well, for me, again, it was one of the first medications and it was just made me really sick. Mm. And like I said, I didn't know that much about it. And even once the, after the AZT, it was the other medications, I was taking like maybe 20 to 30 pills mm. two or three times a day. Mm -hmm. And that was a whole lot okay. to deal with. Um, I want to mention two things. Um, we talk about sexual uh, people highly sexually active and I want to say that that's not the only way we contract uh, HIV okay. even IV drug users that are um, sometimes the population we serve they don't have the money to go buy syringes for yeah. example and you can't go to CVS or Walgreens and get clean syringes so if they are sharing needles there's a high risk there to uh, contract HIV so that's why those psychosocial support services are important yeah. um, another thing that I want to touch on is uh, do the social stigma mm -hmm. uh, the way HIV is perceived is actually a hindrance to individual that are at risk and individual that are living with HIV really but you know uh, Ryan White are you all familiar with yes. Ryan White's story and Ryan White was a young individual who had a drug, I mean, a blood transfusion. Mm -hmm. and, and because of the contamination of the blood, because they wasn't really uh, monitoring the blood work that people were donating at that time. So those who were infected were still donating the blood. Um, and it's, what is it called? Um, the blood disease, I can't, I can't remember. Hemoph Hemophilia. Yeah, mm -hmm. that. Okay, and so by this young man being uh, uh, identified with hemophilia and in elementary school, he couldn't get the type of treatment because the treatment wasn't provided just like HIV treatment, uh, just like substance abuse treatment, I'm sorry. But the substance abuse treatment wasn't available either at that time. So all those things tied in and because of lack of knowledge within a community, a whole community discriminated against this young white guy, young man, right? So uh, I'm saying all that to say that uh, HIV, like my question was, are we living or are we dying? How would you view that with all this information you've given? How, how, how can you say that a person can live a very healthy lifestyle? Well, for me, again, first and foremost, I had to get the substance abuse under control mm -hmm. for myself because I struggled for 27 years and I've been knowing my status for 27 years, but I'm real grateful to say I sit here today with six and a half years clean. Cool. And I'm also undetectable. Mm -hmm. And it's because I got rid of the drugs and I was able to get the medications and I have a substance abuse counselor, mental health and all that, to talk about my issues and I go to the 12-step program. Very good, very good. Uh, to answer your question, I will say uh, we are definitely living, uh, individuals that are living with HIV. And the reason I say that is because uh, when you are diagnosed, you have to make sure that if you are taking your medication, you are more aware of the type of food you are eating. You are more aware of the type of risk that you can be exposed to. And also, let's talk about all the innovation that when it comes to medication, you went from taking 20 something pills to taking one or two pills uh, to keep your medication under control, uh, to get 
your virus, like your viral load under control. Yes. And one of the most beautiful things, um, recently FDA just approved a um, shot for HIV. You okay. can take it for 30 days oh. you, instead of taking your pills every day, you can take it every 30 days and maintain your viral load yes. where it needs to be. So I wanna ask this last question. With COVID-19 being impacting our society and HIV would be one of those underlying conditions, as far as you are concerned, um, Ms. Naomi, uh, did that impact the treatment of those who are affected? Did, did COVID have any impact on them? Yes, a lot. Okay. In the beginning of COVID-19, for example, from uh, April 2020 to beginning of May, there was a shortage of supplies for mm -hmm. NHIV medication. Okay. Although individuals living with HIV have compromised human system, they could not uh, have access to care like they usually, uh, their testing were not being done, uh, they have to meet their doctor virtually. And most of the time the population we serve, the, pop the individual living with HIV, don't have access to uh, electronic to be able to do those telehealth. So yes, it did hinder um, individual majorly, even when vaccination become available, most provider didn't want to give vaccination upfront to individual living with HIV because of potential uh, complications. Wow, see, nobody knows that. So, so as um, in 2020, when COVID hit, the stigma associated with COVID was the same stigma associated with HIV. Don't touch this, don't drink that, don't sit here. So over the years, you have lived with the stigma, you have uh, the research on progress. How would you view HIV now? How would you view surviving, living? How, uh, what's you know, the success in your life? Well, for me, the success was even with when COVID hit, knowing that HIV was a pandemic itself and how I was able to regroup, get the education and deal with it. I had to do the same thing with the COVID virus to the point I had to do what they said to do. I had to wash my hands. I had to wear my mask. I had to keep my six feet distance. And that's what my doctor wanted to know. So for me, it really wasn't that hard because I already dealt with it, living with the virus. You know, it just really wasn't that hard. And I didn't even have any complications or anything like that to even see my doctor. Because even with me doing the 12-step program, we had to go virtual. So I was able to, I had to learn it because I wanted it. If I wanted to live and I wanted to survive, I had to do what I had to do. I'm not good with electronics and stuff either, but I had to do because I wanted to live. I didn't want to go back and use. And I had a foundation, first and foremost, and I'm so grateful for the foundation that I had. I just want to say to you uh, especially, it takes a lot of courage yes. to travel the road less traveled. And in living with any type of disease that the world is against, and you have to live that, it takes a lot of courage to say, okay, I wanna live. Yes. If I have to be on my own, this is what I'm going to do, and this is how I'm going to do it. So when we speak of surviving, then you have really painted that picture today on how to survive it. I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank you, Ms. Julian, for uh, providing us with the expertise and the information, the medical and psycho uh, psychological information that you provided to help someone understand what HIV is and that today, no, you're not dying, but you still have to get your treatment. Like, a, uh, I want to um, expound on the fact that the courage that you all presented today was exceptional. I, I, and, and I know that the information you provided was enough information to, for the uh, viewers to have an opportunity to be more informed on HIV and AIDS. And yes, today we are living. 
Thank you for coming and being a part of what's happening in the streets. Um, and I look to see you in the future. Thanks again. And thank you for having me.